Dimitri Orlov, good morning. Dobry dzień. Dobry dzień. Dobry dzień. Dzień. I'm, my Russian is not that good, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk in English today. Welcome this morning. Um, what a year we've been uh, through. Um, we are seeing many of your, I don't know if we can say prediction, but certainly your analysis of the past decade coming through. We are seeing the United States of America uh, in uh, political, economical, social collapse. Uh, we are doing the steps of the five stages of collapse, which is one of the one of your famous books. And uh, we are in the middle of trying to reinventing collapse all over the world uh, through this crisis of uh, 2020, which is not over. So my first question for you is, um, what's your analysis of the last year of what has happened? Well, um, uh, the, there was a financial collapse that started happening in, in, in 2019 around August, when it turned out that um, uh, United States government debt, which is supposed to be the most secure financial uh, investment in the world, um, couldn't be used as collateral for overnight loans without having to pay something around 10% interest. This isn't a zero uh, percent interest rate environment. So suddenly it turned out that uh, all of this debt was actually useless as collateral uh, and um, was in danger of just being treated as waste paper by major banks. And the Fed had to step in and open up all the spigots and it hasn't been able to close them uh, ever since. It's just been hemorrhaging money, uh, supposedly money, really it's just more debt, but the, the entire notion of debt as something you pay back has evaporated. We're now in a, in a, a brave new world where you can endlessly quote unquote borrow at 0% or even, even negative interest rates. Uh, and this can go on forever without triggering hyperinflation, but certainly it will. Now, the reason all of that started happening is same reason as everything happens. <clears throat> there was a, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a, a, a shortage of energy. Uh, the swing producer in, in the oil world was the United States with shale oil. And suddenly it turned out that that, that party couldn't go on forever because all of the, uh, the best plays were played out. And, and um, in very rough numbers, uh, the overall investment in shale, in US shale was around a trillion dollars, very roughly speaking. And all it ever made was about 700 billion. So that's not a business plan. That, that's just a way of uh, uh, sort of stretching things out a little bit and um, this stopped working at some point. So a way had to be found to, to really cut down consumption in the world. And then this wonderful virus came along, uh, which is basically just a flu virus, but by overreacting to it, uh, people were able to uh, chop the global economy into smaller pieces and shut down the pieces of it that didn't make any sense. So the Chinese economy and the Russian economy still make sense in terms of energy and in terms of productive capacity and ability to profitably manufacture stuff. So those are continuing as before, um, while the US economy, the German economy, the Japanese economy are pretty much just you know, hollow shells of their former selves at this point, probably will never come back. And uh, now that this, uh, virus play has been uh, played out as to, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, now there will be political and, and uh, social consequences with oil prices back over 60 a barrel. Uh, and this is without any uh, economic recovery. Uh, we're going back to the situation of endless debt that's not really debt anymore. Hyperinflation that is about to be triggered um, and uh, the need to reorient um, non-productive uh, national economies uh, along very different lines. Now, it seems um, for the normal observer 
that this um, pandemic, uh, mostly manufactured by, by media and politicians, is managed with a lot of inconsistency and at the same time, paradoxically, coordination across the world. So we have this strange coordination on one side, and I don't know if we can say it's inconsistently or incompetent on the delivery and on the management of people. And um, it seems from what we look and what we hear around that the social unrest is, is boiling up uh, like never before. And um, I wonder, since you have analyzed stages of collapse of societies across history and the world, how do you see this playing out and mostly in the West? Well, mostly in the West, you have this bizarre combination of factors where uh, people are very obedient. They will do whatever they're told to do. Uh, this is rather similar to China and Japan, but very different from many other parts of the world, Russia especially, uh, where you can tell people what to do and they will pretend to do it. And then the people who are supposed to enforce this behavior will pretend to enforce it. And that's as far as it'll go. So that's, that's as far as it has gone in Russia, for instance. But in the West, if you tell people to stay home, they'll actually stay home. And, and uh, if you tell them to wear masks, they will actually wear masks. Um, so uh, this, this ploy of using this virus, this flu virus, to curtail economic activity to a point where the physical economy and the financial realm can somehow be kept in a precarious balance for a little while longer has actually worked. And uh, it won't continue working forever. Uh, they'll have to come up with some other ploy, some other disaster scenario. I don't know, they'll have to invent space aliens or something, but, but they can't use, use the same virus over and over again. Uh, they'll have to come up with at least a different virus. They're trying to do that with all these mutant strains of the coronavirus, but you know, viruses mutate. They don't have a, an error correction mechanism built into them. So they're always mutating. Um, they tend to mutate in the direction of being innocuous, unless, sure. unless you vaccinate everyone, in which case the virus has no choice, but do something and uh, becoming lethal is one of those choices that it might accidentally stumble into. But if you don't vaccinate, then they become innocuous over time. In fact, you, you wrote the foreword of my book, which is now also in English on uh, chemical, radiological, nuclear, and biological uh, mm -hmm. uh, problems or warfare and how you protect yourself. And in fact, uh, the, the biological one is very scary, uh, of course, intellectually, because you don't see the virus, you don't see, um, but, Reality is that with modern medicine and, and if, you have, if you work on good health, instead of staying inside and wearing masks and, and being scared, in fact, the immu immune system of a normal, maybe not obese, that's a problem for many countries now, a human being is pretty simple to, 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 to withstand and reinforce yourself. In most cases, you don't really need medication or even vaccines to, to get over a virus. It's uh, especially not deadly. I don't know in Russia what's the death rate, but it's insignificantly low in the West for sure. Now that we have a, a year, a year data. What's your opinion on the, on um, how this communication around it, how this pandemic, media pandemic at least, has been uh, organized? Well, it's been very different in different countries. So, for instance, in the United States, there was this horrible mistake uh, made by the Democrats who thought that they could uh, play up the pandemic in order to defeat Donald Trump, to basically say that um, it's, it's his fault. And then Donald Trump in his semi-idiotic manner responded by calling it the Chinese virus. Oops and trying to blame the Chinese for it. You know, you, you can't really, you know, see a little red star on the virus. No, it doesn't really think that, um, that definitely didn't work out. Um, and then in, in Europe, um, it's, it's all a matter of blocking information. So uh, the UK went through multiple cycles of lockdown. 
uh, and Sweden did not, and they have identical results. And then if you if you map their their quote unquote pandemic profile on the typical flu season, it it looks the same. So it, this is just a seasonal flu. That's what it looks like. Maybe it has some specific complications, but it doesn't really raise the death rate appreciably. In fact, in Sweden, it's not really noticeable. It's it's just it's in the noise. So again, as an excuse, uh, I think it's pretty much run its course. I think I think people will have have to come up with some other excuse for economic collapse now. And they're I bet they're scratching their heads, thinking, okay, we did this virus thing. What's what's next? Now, I recently read last year's book by Klaus Schwab, which I, I happen to know here in Geneva, and um, mm -hmm. called The Great Reset, COVID-19, The mm -hmm. Great Reset. Paradoxal book, and you recently, on, uh, you recently wrote on your blog, and uh, I advise whoever is watching us to subscribe to either your blog or your Patreon account, uh, which, which is really has great articles, to... And you, you wrote an article that explains why you think this great reset is going to be a complete failure and disaster. And I happen to agree with your analysis. Can you tell us a little bit what's, what's your point of view on this great reset, which we hear so much about? Well, basically, it's a lot of wishful thinking by uh, people who have lots of money and not very much sense uh, on how they can manipulate reality uh, in, in really dramatic revolutionary ways. Um, and it, it's all just wishful thinking, but really it's, it's more like a, a suicide pact. What, they, what they're planning to do is zero everyone out. That's what re reset means, you know? What, what does it mean to reset your bank account? Because we, these are rich people, so we're talking about money because they don't know anything else. Um, so what does it mean to reset your bank account? Hello, this is your bank. We have just reset your bank account. Well, how much money is left in it after they've reset it? Well, zero, right? So that's what great reset means. It, you know, there isn't going to be any money left in people's bank accounts and people's pockets. That's an expected thing. Um, and um, it's going to happen. You know, there, all of this uh, completely unbounded um, money generation is going to end up in hyperinflation once everyone realizes that equities are worthless and, and um, that government debt is worthless, everything is going to pour into commodities and then it'll all pour into the consumer market. And by then they will have to um, uh, introduce digital currency, uh, which you know people for some reason miss the biggest point about digital currency is that if you have paper currency, every time you add a zero, uh, you have to print new money in higher denominations and retire some older denominations. Whereas with digital currency, you can, you can paint as many zeros on the ends of numbers as you like. You can have all the hyperinflation you want. You can reprice everything once a second if you want to. Right, and then if you have to re-denominate a million dollars back to one dollar, well, you can do it overnight, and then there'll be a little green check mark on your phone next to the amount. Hello, you know your 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 currency has been re-denominated for your comfort and convenience. That's all it takes. So we're really setting up technologically for for endless hyperinflation. At the end of which, people will be broke. They'll probably get some kind of a food stamp program in place. Um, basic services to the extent that they will exist will be free. Um, we don't know how basic they'll be and you know uh, whether they'll exist for everyone or not, but there will be something. But these great great reset people think that they can there can be this uh, share not shareholder but stakeholder capitalism thing that they could put together. Well, good luck with that. Um, I think it's been tried before, uh, and um, the reason you haven't heard about it is, is that it hasn't worked. Um, but they're going to try again. Um, this is not these; these are not new ideas. They're just just repackaged. These ideas erupt into space in in a vacuum spontaneously, like flying cars, for instance. Whenever you or Mars missions or you know 
stakeholder economy. I mean, it's it's all the same stuff. It's and it's the same people for for generations, basically. How how long has Charles Schwab been around? You know, decades. Um, so don't expect any great surprises. But I I think uh, what we're really going to go into is. Um, a mode where capitalism has failed, capitalist production, where you um, invest in productive capacities and pay salaries, pay wages, that is no longer going to work in the developed countries in the world. Um, the only way you can make those economies productive is by not being not paying people wages. There's, if you once you cut out the wages, and once you cut out the the consumer spending you might end up with a, a very austere economy that might function on some, some basic level and, and produce some very low level of goods and services, you know, bowl of rice a day, that sort of thing. Um, you know, some, uh, you know, black pajamas for everyone to wear, um, Viet Cong style. Um, so I think what we're going into is, is a very austere environment where there will be a lot of, uh, there'll be a return to slavery back, to, you know, back to basics of, uh, you know, European civilization, you know, it's, it started with Roman slavery, then it went on to medieval slavery, then there was a lot of slave trade with Africans enslavement of Indi India and China, all of those coolies that built the railroads in the United States, you know, black slavery in the US, and then it got canceled in, in the 1870s and 80s, and replaced with industrial slavery that went on for a while. Then there was the trade union movement, you know, the, the Soviets came along, gave it some competition, but now the Soviets are gone, so it's back to slavery. That's, that's what I see. That's the development path that I see. You see uh, people revolting at some point? You see uh, extreme social unrest, if not uh, civil wars or something similar? Well, uh, it used to be that people would physically organize and, and form mobs and go and, and rampage and stampede and, and, and destroy things. Um, but now everyone is organized using their smartphone and their social media accounts. And once you cut off their internet access, it is as if they're newborn babes and they can't even find a place to, to have lunch. Um, and this is what the digital revolution has done. It has made people remarkably docile. So on, on the other hand, there's the, this panopticon that, that is uh, uh, assisted by artificial intelligence systems that allows crowd control uh, to exist at a level that is just unimaginable only a decade ago. So that now nobody can get away with anything. And so in that environment, yes, people will rebel, but uh, that will just be another form of uh, suicide, in this case, social suicide. You know, there's a lot of that in China, for instance, which has very tight social controls and people basically just uh, destroy, destroy their futures by protesting. So very few, pe very few rational people do that. Um, it's been a problem in, in, in Russia recently where young people have been going out and, and, uh, and protesting. Uh, basically, there was been, there's been a lot of incitement to protest from outside the country, um, supported by various Western organizations on behalf of this fellow Navalny, who is a criminal who's in jail now. Um, and they've been, pretty much by breaking the law in this fashion, they've been ruining their futures. Uh, they, their, their futures are, are pretty much toast. And that's a big problem because a lot of these young people don't really understand, as young people generally, don't understand the consequences of their actions. So that's where a, you know, a, great re a great reset would be very helpful. So beyond a certain age, you know, all of that should be written off. It's like, okay, you were crazy before, now you're no longer crazy, fine, you're cured. You can rejoin civilized society. Um, but you know, I, I don't think protest really is, is going to be effective in the same way that, that it was before. I think there will be a lot of silent protest where people just drop out, refuse to be productive, refuse to cooperate. There'll be a lot of, a lot of loss of productive capacity in society uh, because that's the only way you can really protest is by being passive. Mm -hmm. Now the... Um... 
2021 uh, starts and we're still in some semi-confinement depending of, uh, of countries. How do you see uh, this year playing out for, for especially United States or, or Western Europe? Do you see a um, return to some sort of normal or, or do you see what you just explained, some uh, pillaging uh, uh, of, the, of whatever wealth is left, which is actually negative if you total the, the wealth of people. Most people are in debt. Uh, how, do we, how do we go from, from here in your opinion? Well, I don't think that uh, Western countries in the US will be able to relinquish these social controls, um, especially the United States, where a third of the population now is in favor of secession of wherever they happen to be. The, the entire project of the United States is no longer popular with uh, much of the population. Um, that is a very extreme result that a third of the people want the country to disappear to. To, to be broken up into pieces. Um, so in that environment, um, I don't know what sort of grasping at straws, um, you know, the federal government and, and those in power at this point, it's uh, just one part of the democratic establishment, um, what, what they will resort to. What we have in the United States now is basically the Obama administration that's been, uh, uh, pulled out of uh, the, the freezer, defrosted in the microwave, given some very strong black coffee and, and sent out into the world to do their worst. You know, that's basically what it is. They're just a bunch of zombies running around. Um, you, see the same, you see the same faces that you saw before. What have they been doing for the last four years? Well, they've been in think tanks, et cetera. They, they've been kept fed, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but they haven't produced any new ideas. They haven't produced any great surprises. I don't see any books coming out of them saying, this is the great new way forward. No, they're just trying the same tricks that they were before. Um, so I think that you know there, 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 there will be some desperate moves, but I don't think they will add up to much. And I think there will be lots of disasters, big and small. Now, we, we have been living in the West for most people in a state of fear in a state of um, uh, manipulation and pushing through social, social networks, through the mass media, especially for older people. They push all the buttons of fear and to bring these emotions up. How, how in your opinion, do, avoid, do we avoid to be uh, manipulated and how do we avoid this uh, fearful emotions that lead us to either submission or to do what they want us to do? Well, it, my, my metaphor for it is dealing, is dealing with, uh, you know, religious people in your midst, whatever that religion is. You don't, you don't go out of your way to offend their feelings. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't have to go along with the entire program of genuflecting or whatever it is they, they, they insist on doing themselves. You can very much see that in, in, in Russia um, uh, where religious tolerance is foundational for the entire civilization has been for over a thousand years. You know, it's part Christian, part Muslim and everybody gets along by not offending each other's feelings. So, uh, you know, a Christian can go into a mosque and they have to take their shoes off. Uh, um, and uh, a Muslim can go into a church and they have to take their, men have to take off their hat, uh, hats and, and women have to uh, put on kerchiefs um, and, and be respectful in other ways. So the same way when, when all of these, this mask wearing and glove wearing and, and social distancing went into effect in Russia, same as everywhere else pretty much, the Russian observance of it was sort of you could say lackadaisical, like the Russians wouldn't just in your face refuse to wear a mask, but they would do it in a way that truly showed that they were just basically complying, that they, were, they weren't really buying into the program at all. So that's pretty, pretty much the way to deal with it is to, to humor those who are trying to impose these social controls and then work very hard to circumvent them, which is typical, normal, uh, 
social behavior. The problem is that in Western Europe, people have been um, so repressed for so many centuries into uh, being strict followers of the law and of rules and of finding some kind of value in these laws themselves as opposed to you know, human freedom, that, that they tend to generate a lot of friction and conflict the moment they rebel even in the tiniest ways. Uh, so Western Europeans are very maladapted to this environment at this point, they'll have to catch up. Could I bring an objection? Um, I would say that what is strange on, on what you said, I think is correct, but I would add this. In Russia, you came from, uh, in, in, up until the mid 19th century, there was serfdom still. And um, then of course, with um, the communist regime, I think people learned to have this uh, one face to the authority and one face to themselves and to their close friends. And I see knowing many Russian friends and having a Russian girlfriend that the first reaction with people is very cold and distant. And only when you really know them, you become extremely good friends. However, in the West, we've had this illusion of freedom, especially in the 19th and 20th century. A friend of mine once said to me, from, he was from Tunisia under the, um, was it Ben Ali at the time, uh, regime and said, the difference between you and me is that we know we're not in a democracy and, uh, and, uh, and you don't. So, so could it be that the, the, the West, especially the baby boomers generation, they had this illusion of freedom and of, uh, because they had consumption choice and, and they, equate, they, they equate consumption choice with freedom when in reality we're just under the same boot that is now revealing itself. And so we don't know how to react. Whereas in, in Russia and perhaps China, I don't know China that well, um, you are, people are, are, and perhaps even in the Middle East, people are more used to be smart and have one face to the authority and one face to their families and friends. What, what do you think of that? Well, in, in Russia, there's a, a very strong communalist aspect. Uh, uh, what people don't understand uh, about Russian serfdom uh, is, not, is that it wasn't really serfdom. Uh, it, the, 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 the word for it is, has nothing to do with serfdom, it's krepastnoe prava, and it's actually peasants' rights. Mm -hmm. um, peasants could not be dislodged from their land. They had the right to use that land. They, they owed the landlord or the owner of the land, not really a landlord, but whoever was set to supervise uh, that patch of land, they, they owed some amount of allegiance and labor, which was very carefully circumscribed in all other ways, peasant communities managed themselves and were internally democratic. Uh, this was destroyed after the quote unquote serfdom was uh, abolished in, in 1861 and, and with disastrous results. Um, uh, Russian history is riddled with these examples of, of Tsars trying to convert Russia along European lines and failing. Um, this was one of the most glaring failures that in many ways led to the October Revolution, which is a big disaster in Russian history, one of the biggest ones. But uh, throughout history, Russia has always reverted to its communalist roots and, and cannot be prevented from doing so by, by any government, by any force. It will always be basically organized as an empire looking up towards an emperor and despising everyone between the emperor and themselves, and then organizing democratically at the local level. This is, this is what Russia has been for a thousand years or, or more, and it'll remain that way. What, what that means for Western Europe is, is that um, uh, Western Europe is this little peninsula jutting off into the, the Atlantic Ocean, bordered by this gigantic land, which has a completely different set of traditions that cannot be even described using European languages. English lacks the vocabulary to describe how the Russians see the world. And this is a major cause of misunderstandings and it'll, it'll persist. Okay, what can we do as uh, people, as individuals across the world to not fall into that fear and, um, 
not being manipulated as 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 we are, or perhaps even, uh, and I think a lot of your books tell us, and a lot of the authors you published uh, and you helped publish over the years, tell stories about uh, alternative ways of life from the work in the tertiary uh, uh, economy. What what can we do, in your opinion? I think it's, uh, I, I don't really feel like I can give blanket advice to everyone. Um, people get very much wrapped up in, in visions of the future. Um, uh, there, there's a, a, an entire genre, you could say, of disaster porn that, that people get wrapped up in, which is a really bad way to go. Um, there's also uh, an entire industry trying to coerce people into this or that political category, which is also really bad because uh, there are very few political solutions to most of the world's problems. I would say that uh, probably the most productive uh, thing people can do is understand the physics of the situation, understand what the energy flows are that they depend on and, and how they're going to be affected by the changes that are happening that will continue to be happening. Uh, we're basically heading into a period where uh, the world is being fractured into zones. That's already happening. You know, all of those flights that got canceled, those were basically links between parts of the world that are very forcefully being severed. Um, the, the world is going to be split up into sections and some of those sections are going to undergo energy starvation. So per capita energy consumption is going to plummet. And one of the things you might want to do is figure out how to get your energy supply decoupled from the surrounding economy to the greatest extent possible. Um, and in a lot of cases, that means becoming rural in, in some ways. Um, so that is something a lot of people need to look at. Um, another um, aspect that people should look at is, um, do they really um, know who's around them? Um, so people who live in big metropolitan areas um, would not be able to exist once the lights go out. Because big metropolitan areas become extremely unsafe without electricity. That is something that we should expect. Um, and again, uh, uh, looking to places to settle that are are smaller in scope where people know each other, where people can be resourceful at the individual level um, and help each other, you know, that they become more resilient that way and, and, and much, much more able to cope. So for instance, if you live in a high rise building and the electricity goes out, you're not going to organize your neighbors to go out and fix the electricity. But if you live in a village and the electricity goes out, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to go and get that diesel fired up, whatever you have to do to get the electricity flowing again. Um, so that's what that 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 would be the, the most general advice I can give. Thank you. How, uh, however, not however, uh, the difference from the last time we used to be a, a, a rural world and now is somewhere like six billion people. <laughs> so obviously the, the, the big question that is coming, and that's something I write in my books and you also mentioned in yours, is that um, the going into rural or having a major crisis, probably the, the biggest we've ever, ever had on a world scale with eight billion people, uh, is not going to be is not going to be pretty nor easy, and uh, and so the question is always, how do you manage that decline on a personal level and also perhaps on a psychological level as we are seeing now when people are are cut from their habits, and and we are definitely seeing now when you read the psychiatric reports from many countries, we you see an increase and and, and this crisis was just you know staying home watching TV and. Uh, and, and, and getting pizza delivered, which is not being in the trenches of World War I or in the camps of World War II, it's a different experience. Well, um, the, the suicide rate of teenagers has doubled the, uh, uh, I think there was 15% increase in, in, in depressions in, 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 and, and, and soon you will start to see a more psychotic uh, 
uh, actions with uh, killings, domestic violence increasing even more. Um, multiply this by 8 billion people that suddenly have a shrinking, a fast shrinking economy and way of life with less electricity perhaps. Uh, it's very hard to go from the level of Switzerland to the level of Nigeria, both countries that I've worked in and know. So um, how do you think people will cope and what do you think is going to be? I know in your books, you're pretty candid about how, how this is going to be brutal if you stay in the cities, especially. I think it's going to be different in different places. You know, you can say 8 billion and, and use, use the pronoun we, and it's, it's really just a, a really huge stretch because you, you can't, you can't really take in the entire world at once. Every place is going to be different. Um, some, some countries are incredibly resource scarce and overpopulated and stressed. And the people there, if you go and visit, uh, well, they, they, they're not, some of them might be malnourished, but it's, it's not like everybody's starving and uh, they, they adapt in various ways. And, um, you know, no matter what happens, they have a, a completely fatalistic outlook that helps them along. So they're alive until they die. And then once they die, it's over. Um, the end, they're easy. Um, and uh, in, in other places, people have everything they need 10 times over. And when they get, they're deprived of a tiny piece of it, like they can't get, uh, you know, a software upgrade for their uh, smartphone, uh, they, they panic, you know, and, and they go into shock. Well, you know, that's a, that's a different type of we, I would say, that's completely incompatible with my previous example. Um, there are countries that are overpopulated, there are countries that are underpopulated and have all the resources in the world, but not enough people. Russia is one of those countries. Uh, Russia needs to double its population uh, to be at some kind of optimum. Um, so I, I don't see a, a one size fits all solution to the entire globe. What I see is separation into zones. Uh, some zones will continue at a high level of civilization and, and technological development. Uh, some will go down, 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 down to some subsistence level with uh, a lot of lives cut short. And some will just completely explode and fail and become sort of like Somalia-like uh, with people hiding in, in holes in the ground, uh, waiting to be shot by somebody. Um, you know, things can get arbitrarily bad. And, and it's one of those things to watch out for, uh, you know, how good things are now is a predictor of how bad things are likely to get in the future. If you're surrounded by people who've been coddled all their lives and comfortable and expect the best for themselves and, and, and their children, then you're probably not with the right bunch. And if you're with people who are just waiting to die, then you're probably not with the right bunch either. It's somewhere in the middle that's the comfort zone. California, you are warned. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think, I think California has warned itself enough times. They, they have a mindset that they, they're about to fall into the sea that they've had for generations now. <laughs> Well, Dimitri Orlov, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit of your next projects? Do you have any, any interesting books coming out soon or what, what do you plan to do? Well, actually, I'm uh, right now uh, researching just in a completely different direction because I, I used to uh, have a lot to do with boats. I, I lived on a yacht for a long time and did a lot of yacht maintenance and, and got involved in, in researching boat building. Uh, I moved off the boat for various reasons before any of that came to fruition. But now that I'm in Russia and have access to all the land I could possibly want, I started looking at how to build houses quickly and cheaply and, and have been researching, well, following up on, on research and existing uh, systems for very quickly constructing buildings pretty much out of uh, wasted waste wood material and a, bit, a little bit of cement. Uh, there's this, this material called arbolite, which is an insulator. It's a structural material. It doesn't sink and it doesn't burn and it doesn't decay. And it consists of stuff um, that you can get delivered in bulk from any sawmill. 
uh, just paying for the transportation. Excellent. I think this is uh, this is something that will uh, go well in the future. Well, Dimitri, hoping to to speak to you soon. I will put the links to your sites uh, in the description of the video. And das vidanya and and spasibo. Thank thank you very much. Thank you. Take bye care. Bye.